Uh, Galatians for Beginners, this is lesson number eight. If you're checking your notes there, lesson number eight. And we will attempt to cover Galatians 3, 23, all the way to chapter 4, 31. Got to have an objective, right? That's going to be our objective. Okay, so in our last lesson, Paul the Apostle was explaining to his readers that God's faith system for salvation was a basic teaching of scripture. He wasn't introducing anything new. Salvation was always based on faith. He also summarizes how both the law system and the faith system, how they work together to bring us to Christ and the end result of that, you know, the law system and faith system working together to bring us to Christ, what happens when we finally arrive there. So in chapter three, verse 23, in these verses, he's going to use the word faith in two different ways. And you need to understand this if you're going to understand this passage. The two ways that he uses the word faith. He uses one form of the word faith, which means to believe. I have faith in you. I believe you. I trust you. So faith in the sense of trusting and believing. And then the other uh, way that faith is used in the Greek with the article uh, refers to the faith or a body of teaching or the gospel or the revelation of God's promise. Okay? So there's faith, I trust, I believe, and then there's the, the faith which refers to a body of teaching or doctrine or the gospel. If you understand the difference between those two, then as you read this passage, it'll make a whole lot more sense. So let's start Verse 23, he says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. So he says, before faith, belief, faith, trust, faith. Before belief in Jesus resulting in salvation arrived, he says, the law served as a restrainer to guide, to mitigate until the faith, meaning the gospel, the teaching of Jesus was revealed. Okay, verse 24, he goes on and says, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So uh, you need to understand the idea of, of the, the social custom of the era uh, tutors were usually well-educated slaves who were responsible for the care and education of rich young Roman boys, uh, Roman and Greek boys. Uh, they were not the parents, but these tutors had the necessary authority from the parents to discipline and to train those boys, those children. When manhood came, the child was released from the tutor and he was free to receive his inheritance and you know, to be emancipated. That's how, it, that's how it worked. So Paul makes this analogy in reference to the law and how it trained us and discipled God's people until they were ready for sonship and maturity and the inheritance promised by the Father in heaven. So what this law has prepared us for is to receive the promises and to receive them how? Well, to receive them by a system of faith, belief in Christ. You know when he says, so that we may be justified by faith? Well, he's not talking about the faith, the doctrines. He's saying we'll be justified by faith, by believing, by trusting. Okay, verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So now that which faith is it? Well, in the Greek it's now that the faith, meaning the gospel, the information, now that that has come, now that that's been revealed, it is the sign that the tutor, which is the law, the law system, the tutor is no longer necessary. It has served its purpose. So you see the analogy between the social custom of the tutor training young boys unto emancipation and the law being the tutor of believers until they were mature enough to understand the gospel and to be set free and receive the inheritance. We know what the inheritance is, right? Eternal life and so on and so forth. All right, so the final summary and results of God's work uh, will be explained in verses 26 to the end. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith 
in Christ Jesus. Again, which, what's faith here? Through doctrine or through believing? Well, it's through believing, okay? And so the, the, the principle is summarized. The essence of the promise was that all would become sons of God and inherit the blessings that come with the position of being a son of God, son or daughter of God. That promise is obtained through the faith system and that faith system was originally revealed to Abraham. Okay? The gospel reveals the one who demonstrated perfect faith, obtained all the blessings for us, and in whom we have our faith, and that should be Jesus. Verse 27, the expression of this faith is now explained. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now Abraham, if we remember the story of Abraham, Abraham expressed his faith beginning with circumcision and ending with the offer of his own son Isaac. Now we know that Abraham, he wasn't perfect, he failed in many ways, but his intention was always to remain faithful. That was his intention. Our expression of faith begins not with circumcision, our expression of faith begins with baptism, and it ends with the offering of ourselves as living sacrifices in service and purity. We don't offer somebody else the most precious thing, we offer ourselves. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 12, verse one, when he says, I adjure you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Okay, so you know, we, we believe in Jesus, right? And that first expression of faith is our death and burial in the waters of baptism. Then our ongoing expression of faith is the offering of ourselves every single day to God in a variety of ways. Now, faith in the Bible has three components. It was interesting that Dayton, Sunday night when I wasn't here, you know, mentioned this idea as part of this lesson. Faith has three components, biblical faith. It has the component of trust, the component of obedience, and the component of acknowledgement. And the problem in many people's theology today is that they see faith in the Bible as merely acknowledgement, meaning I believe as true that Jesus is God. I acknowledge that that is true and I believe that to be true. But they leave out the trusting part and the obeying part. Biblical faith, you know, the faith that saves you, it has all three components working. Abraham's faith, Paul says, is the model for this kind of biblical faith, right? What did he do? Well, he trusted God to provide for him. He trusted Him. He also acknowledged God's presence in his life. And as we know, he obeyed God's directive. His intention was to obey and to obey perfectly. Now he didn't always do this, he didn't always do the will of God, but the purpose of his will was to do it, and thus he was considered righteous. This is why only God can judge, because only God can see the effort of the heart. Only God sees that, nobody else. Some people say, wow, uh, in order to have Abraham's faith, you know, do I have to offer my firstborn? I don't think I could ever do that. The point is, if, if your faith develops to the point that Abraham's faith developed, you could do it if you had to. God doesn't ask you to do it, but you could if your faith you know, got to that point. What does Jesus say? If you, have, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thrown. Well, if you had the faith that He requires of you, you could. So in verse 28, he describes the result of this faith system. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the result of the faith system. Unity of believers through Jesus Christ. Men are still men, women are still women, but now through this system of faith, they can all have a relationship with God and with each other 
on a spiritual level which was not possible before. So this verse <laughs> has been so mangled <laughs> in our day and age. This verse does not free the slaves. They were still slaves after. It doesn't give women authority in the church. It doesn't eliminate cultural differences. We are still what we are and we still play the roles that we do. What it does do is reveal that in God's eyes, all those united to Christ are of equal value and they are the recipients of equal blessings. So the free person and the slave, they're both equal in value to God. The male and the female, they're both value, uh, same value to God, same reward to God. Okay, so that, that was the point. Now, that's the result of the faith system, that all become one in Christ. The purpose of God's plan, what was it? He says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So God fulfills His original promise to Abraham. And what was that? That all nations are blessed through the seed of Abraham, who is Jesus Christ. He's the seed of Abraham. For the Jews who knew the scriptures, the revelation wasn't that the Gentiles would be saved because if you understood the Old Testament, you understood that the prophets often talked about the Gentiles being saved, being brought in. The revelation to the Jews was that they would be united to the Gentiles to form one single saved group. That was the news to the Jews. And many of them <laughs> were not happy about that. They liked the idea of the exclusive you know, cultural advantages that they had. Yeah, sure, the Gentiles, yeah, they can be saved. Let them go to their own churches. Oh, you mean they're going to be in our church? You mean a Gentile will be an elder in the church and you know, have authority over a Jew who's not an elder? You know what I'm saying? That's the part they, they, couldn't, they couldn't take. So in this very long passage, Paul has one objective, and deals with three issues. His objective is to show that the promise made to Abraham in all of its forms, sonship, righteousness, blessedness, so on and so forth, all of these uh, were obtained through a system of faith in the same way that all of the other spiritual blessings are apprehended. The faith system has always been the way that God has transferred blessings from Himself to man. Always the faith system, always. So in this context, he explains three things. Number one, the faith system is scriptural. Okay. It was what God required of Abraham, and it is what God requires of everyone who was to come to Him, both Jew and Gentile. Both Jew and Gentile had to come to the Lord through faith. There is no other system. Number two, the purpose of the law. He explains the scope and purpose of the law, why God gave it and what it could and could not do. Why did He give it? To prepare us for the coming of Christ. And you couldn't change God's faith system or make men righteous through the law. He explained that. The purpose of the law just to prepare us for the coming of Christ and the preaching of the gospel. It couldn't make you a better person. As a matter of fact, it showed you that you weren't a good person and it revealed to you what were the consequences of that. All right. And number three, how law and faith work together. It's never one or the other, it's both of them working together in harmony. So he summarizes how the law worked to bring us to Christ and then the result of the faith system. So what's the result of the faith system? Well, personal righteousness. I'm okay with God. Why? Because I believe in Jesus. That's why. Not because I get everything right, but because He got everything right on my behalf. And also the faith system provides unity in Christ for everyone, regardless of culture or sex or social position, whatever. Everybody's in the same unit. All right. So we move on to chapter four. And the opening section of chapter four has two purposes. 
One, to summarize the transformation spoken of before, you know, from slave to son. And also to provide a bridge to the next large section that's going to deal with the idea of freedom. So that's how Paul writes. He explains something, he's, you know, he's explaining, he's explaining, he's explaining, and then he builds a bridge. He uses a word or an image or something like that. And then that, on that, he crosses that bridge and begins to discuss in detail the thing that he you know, bridged to. And he'll talk about that in detail and then he'll pop up another image or another keyword and then he'll build a bridge with that keyword to his next idea. So that's exactly what he is going to do here. The, these two ideas, uh, the idea of um, the, the, uh, the transformation from slave to son, that idea, and uh, 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 the idea of freedom. Uh, he doesn't discuss it like I do my notes, you know, number one, A, B, C, number two, you know, he, he doesn't write like that. We, I write like that. You know, the Western mindset is like that. It, it helps understand, you know, break down the ideas. He doesn't write like that. He takes the idea of sonship you know, and freedom and he, it's like knitting. He knits these two ideas together into one seamless narrative. So if we understand you know, the two strands, it'll help us understand what he's talking about. All right, so as a way to kind of prepare you for chapter four. So let's take a look at chapter four. He says, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under the guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the, under the elemental things of the world. So re you remember what he talked about before, sonship and the tutor, you know, the tutor you know, training the child. Well, now he's getting into it. Now he's explaining this idea and people understand because this was the, the norm in that society, tutors that trained children until they were emancipated. So what, if, what does he say? He reviews the idea of guardians that a son is placed under. He highlights that even if the son is to inherit everything, he is no better than a slave while he's under the tutor. Now the elemental things that he talks about, those are the ABCs of knowledge. The physical applications and restrictions of the law regarding food and sacrifice and social customs and so on and so forth. And God's son should live above these kinds of things, he said, but until Christ came, we were subject to them instead. And in verse four and five he says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So Jesus comes into the world, He comes in the flesh to suffer, to submit Himself to all the same restrictions, you know, under the law, so that He could offer a perfect sacrifice of Himself and pay the debt caused by the law and thus free man from the bondage and the tutelage and the tutorage of the law. We're under the law, he says, and while you're under the law, you got rules, you got commandments and so on and so forth. And the learning part is learning how to obey those things. And uh, you find out if you're under the law that you can never obey those things. If it wasn't for Jesus, you'd always be under the law. And, and, and you'd end up as a, as a fatality of the law, end up condemned. So he says, but Jesus comes along, he lives like you in the flesh, he lives under the rules, under the laws, but the difference is he obeys the law. He fulfills all the things, every requirement of the law, he fulfills every, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou, he fulfills everything on our behalf, okay? So it's as if he learned and performed all the lessons of the tutor and thus fulfilled on our behalf all the requirements of the tutor so that we could have freedom from the tutor. In other words, he, another way of saying it, he comes and he writes our final exam and he gets 100% and, and we get credit for it. Just a simple way of explaining what he's trying to, or what he is doing here. Verse six and seven, he says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So once Christ has accomplished the removal of the tutor and brought us into sonship, we are prepared to receive the inheritance of the sons of God. And what is that? Well, he says, the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit who brings us into mature intimacy with our Father. In the end, people say, what, 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 what is heaven going to be like? I mean, I don't know, but from what I'm reading, okay, from what I'm reading, it seems to me that heaven is going to be my relationship with God, okay, with no interference from sin. That's heaven. That you should know God and His Son, Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that you should know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, where are the harps? Where's the good food? Where are the 72 virgins or whatever? You know, what, what's the... So he says in one sense, this is, this is the nature of eternal life. You, in, a relation, in an intimate relationship with God, and that just keeps on going. Why? Because God's eternal. Remember when you first dated your significant other at the very beginning? Couldn't get enough, right? Stayed on the phone. You know? Oh dear, that first date, that first thing, you couldn't believe that such a wonderful person was there and so on and so forth. And you're on the phone and, okay, good night. Well, no, you say good night. No, I'll say good night. No, no, you say good night. I love you. Well, I love you too. Okay, good night, good night. You hang up first. No, no, you hang up. You know what I'm saying? We can't get enough. We can't get enough. Imagine the type of relationship we will have with God when sin is not in the way. All right, so keeping that in mind, that's the, the, the essence of our inheritance, our gift, okay? So what does he say? So how, does, how, do we get, how do we start getting to that? He says, you receive the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? He brings us into that intimate relationship with God. He's the one that does that. Paul repeats that one who has this relationship with God through the Spirit made possible by Jesus, that person is no longer a slave, that person is a son. Big difference. You know, the pizza guy comes to my house, yeah, and I greet him, hi, how are you, thanks for the pizza, here's your money, here's your tip, that's it, you know, I'm friendly, it's good. But my son, we sit down, we eat the food together, we enjoy the evening together. Two men, same pizza, same house, big difference in the relationship. So now in the second section, or in the next section, Paul is going to continue this line of thinking, but he's going to discuss the issue in the light of freedom rather than in the light of sonship. That's what he does. He explains the same thing over again using another image. All right? So freedom, he says, we'll say, comes by sonship. How do you gain sonship? You know, being a child of God, through faith. Now he's going to say, well, you know, if you're a son, you're free. How, how, how does freedom come? Well, same way, through faith. And so having established how they have obtained their sonship and thus their freedom, he admonishes them for abandoning this precious gift and returning to bondage and slavery. In other words, these guys want to go back to the tutor. And he's saying, are you out of your mind? You've been set free from, you know, you've got your inheritance through the Spirit. You know, you, and you want to go back to the tutor? Now he switches. The reason he switches from sonship to freedom is that the idea of freedom highlights how ridiculous it is to go back to the tutor. Okay? So verse 8. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. He reminds the Gentiles at Galatia that although the Jews were slaves kept under the law, they, the Gentiles, were slaves to idols, which was worse. The law was preparing, at least the law was preparing the Jews for Christ. The Gentiles, their idols didn't lead them anywhere, just to death. In verse 9 to 11, he says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. So he, he rebukes them for desiring to return to the type of enslavement to basic things that characterized both Jewish and Gentile past. And he's afraid that his work may not have been for anything. 
I, mean, I, I, I can, believe me, I can relate to this. Anyone who has kind of been in the church for a long time or served in some capacity in the church, people that come, you study with them, you encourage them, you know, all kinds of things, you nurture them in Christ, you, know, you bring them along several years, you pour your heart into that relationship, hoping that they'll grow and they do, and blah, 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 and then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. They blow up, they get mad at something, they become discouraged, I don't know, whatever, whatever happens, and they disappear, and they fall away. That's, that hurts, because you've poured yourself into that uh, relationship, not to gain anything. You've poured yourself into that relationship to give something. Uh, I look at some of the ladies here who have taught you know, classes, the little children's class, and you have watched these children that you've taught and nurtured and mentored for years and years and years through VBS and teen class and camp and blah, and then all of a sudden, after a, a lifetime of, of training and teaching and loving, you know, they just take off, they just disappear, they, they abandon the church. Wow, that, that's a heartache. That's what he's talking about here. Man, I've, I've suffered, I've gone to jail for you people. <laughs> They've beaten me up because of what I'm trying to do with you. And now you want to go back to where you were? So he rebukes them for this type of thing. Now Paul makes an emotional appeal for them to remember how enthusiastically they received him when he first came to them and to return to that type of relationship with him and that type of position. So in verse 12 he says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also uh, have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. Paul the Jew, under law, became like them, Gentiles without the law, when he became a Christian. Now they are becoming like he used to be under the law. And he says they should become like he is now, like they were before, which is not under the law. I'm free, you're free. Now you're wanting to go back under the law? No, you know, stay like I am, freedom in Christ. So he holds no grudge against them. It's not his honor that's at stake, it's their souls that are at stake. Verse 13 to 15. He says, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So in the beginning they received him with enthusiasm, even though he was sick, we don't know of what, but when he first met them, uh, he was ill. This idea, I would, I would pluck out my eyes. Sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, that means his illness was he had eye problems. But the, uh, the, the term plucking out your eyes, uh, that was the expression. We don't use that anymore, but today we use the expression, he would give his shirt off his back. Okay, so we know what that means, right? Somebody say, oh, that part of eyes, she'd give, you know, he'd give his shirt off his back, meaning he would do anything. Generous to a fault, do anything to help you. Well, that's what he's saying. Yeah, you, at the beginning, you, you, you'd do anything to help me. What happened? You were enthusiastic about the gospel. What happened? Verse 16, he says, so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you. Remember, eh, the false teachers. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. So he asks if they reject him because he is telling them the truth, what they don't want to hear at the moment. The Judaizers are pursuing them in an unjust manner so that the Galatians will honor them, and the way they are doing it is by establishing themselves as the only teachers that the Galatians will listen to and create kind of a desire for their doctrines. They, they want to be the ones you know, sought after and, 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 and praised. So Paul says, it's good to be sought as a teacher, but for the right reasons. And not only when he is there in person. He was sought by them when there, but they have strayed in his, in his absence. Continuing 19, he says, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. 
So he uses this tender language of an expectant parent who suffers as a child, um, whom she nourishes with her own body. The mother, of course, is fully formed. He wishes he could be there in person to convey also by the tone of voice what he desires for them because he's at his wit's end. He's exasperated almost with them. Can't believe what's going on. So now we get to the final section of what we're studying and that's a, an allegorical uh, example. Uh, the allegory of Sarah and Hagar that he's going to go here. Now there's a term that refers to a story that, or the, the term allegory, okay. Uh, it is a term that refers to a story that has a superficial and a deeper meaning. Okay? Sometimes uh, like in a parable or something like that, it has a, a top meaning and a, and a bottom meaning. Okay? So Paul tells the Galatians that the story of Sarah and Hagar is an allegory with a, su a superficial and a deeper meaning that is pertinent in their situations. So let's read verse 21. He said, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? He now resumes his argument from his emotional appeal of a few verses before. Those who claim that what they do is according to the law do so in ignorance of what the law is really saying. And so he proceeds to reveal the deeper significance of the story told within the pages of the law. Verse 22 and 3. He says, for it is written, when he says for it is written, he's talking about the law. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman, free woman through the promise. So Abraham was promised a son, we know the story, by his wife Sarah. When, he, uh, when the son didn't arrive, Sarah, who couldn't conceive, uh, gave Abraham, her husband, her slave Hagar to conceive. This, this was a type of thing in that society that was done at that time. To have children by your slave, they were your children. All right? So we know the story. Hagar does conceive a son, Ishmael, but eventually was put out of the house by Sarah once Sarah conceived Isaac, who was the child of promise. Okay? The implication here is that the child that came by the promise has preeminence over the child that came by the flesh. So in verse 24, he continues, he says, this is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. So Paul uh, explains the deeper meaning of this story. Hagar represents the law. Sarah represents grace. Hagar represents the present Jerusalem under Judaism, without Christ, under bondage to the law, coming from Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's where the law was given. It, it, you know, the law was given on Mount Sinai with a lot of you know, uh, uh, thunder and lightning and so on and so forth, but Mount Sinai is not in the land of promise. It's in the desert. That's where the law comes from. Okay? Then he talks about Sarah. Sarah represents the Jerusalem not in Israel, the Jerusalem from above, God's spiritual kingdom. Its members are heirs because of grace. In other words, they receive it through faith, not through nationality, not through giving birth physically. Like Sarah, who gave birth because of God's grace, remember she had a child when she was 90 years old. That's giving birth through grace. Um, so Sarah, who gave birth because of God's grace, in fulfillment of what? A promise. He promised she would have a child. So those who belong to the spiritual Jerusalem do so because of God's grace and because of God's promise in Christ, 
not because of nationality, not because of law. That's what these Judaizers were doing. We're the real Jews. We can trace our you know, ancestry. We're, we're from Jerusalem, the main city, you know, where the temple is, you know, and the law is, and the pomp is, and the ceremony is. We're those guys. We're the legitimate ones. That, that was the argument. Okay. Now he quotes Isaiah 54.1 at the end, and Isaiah reinforces that the descendants of Sarah, she was the one who was desolate, she was the one who suffered because she couldn't have a child naturally for most of her life. So the descendants of Sarah, the desolate one, will ultimately be greater than the one who gave birth naturally while she was young and while she was full of strength. That was Hagar. So if you, if you were a betting man back in the day when they were both in the house, Sarah couldn't have a child, Hagar, you know, first try, she has a baby, where would your money lie to see how the promise was fulfilled that, that God had said, you're going to have numerous descendants and you know, the, more than the stars in the sky. Are you going to put your money on Sarah who can't conceive a child? Or are you going to put it on uh, uh, Hagar, young, strong woman who has this child right away? Well, you know. So Isaiah is saying, yes, but the children of the promise, they're the ones that are going to be greater than the stars in the heaven, not, not the child of the flesh, the natural birth one. Okay. Verse 28 to 31, and you brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. So like Isaac, Christians are children of the promise, not the law. They received the promise through faith. It's not surprising that the Judaizers, who are in a sense the descendants of the bondwoman Hagar, whose son Ishmael persecuted Isaac, who was the son of promise. It's not surprising that these same people should persecute Christians, who are the son of the free woman, Sarah, in exactly the same way. So in Genesis, um, uh, we know that Sarah cast out Hagar and her son when she became pregnant. Paul says that in the same way, they should cast out any attempt to displace them, any doctrine or person that tries to rob them of their true position as free men and sons of the promise. And he repeats that in uh, verse 31. Okay, a couple of lessons for this entire section, then we're done for tonight. Lesson number one, blessings come through Christ. From the very beginning, God promised that the spiritual blessing of righteousness and the Holy Spirit and sonship and freedom, all of this would be given through what? Through the seed, and the seed is Jesus Christ. No other religion no other Messiah, no other philosophy, no other method. Those things only come through Christ. Number two, blessings also are obtained by faith in Christ. The blessings were available to everyone who would be united to Jesus by faith. And of course, as we've taught, as Paul taught, and that faith is initially expressed through repentance and baptism. Law, uh, lesson number three, the law What's its purpose? It prepares us for Christ. The law was introduced in history in order to mitigate the evil of sin and prepare man for the coming of Jesus. It did not have the power to confer any blessings. There are no blessings that come through the law. Okay? And then lesson number four, law keeping fails every time. Anyone who attempted to gain these blessings through some form of law keeping would fail. Anyone who taught this should be rejected and would ultimately be cursed by God. All right, well that's a mouthful. I love Galatians. It's, I love Galatians because it's all about freedom.